So why are we on Corbin? The game didn't tell us. We had no dream and no vision. Where's Shepard? We have no idea. What are we even doing here? So we go talk to our pilot, Caden, but he doesn't tell us. Instead, we talk to him about us being Revan and his subplot, what his subplot has done. It was an official subplot as well. Thank you very much, Bioware, because his goal was to end Saul, or as I like to call him, Zaid. It aligned with our goals, and killing him fell along with the main plot, so we kind of had to do it. Caden was along for the ride. He got what he wanted. We curb stomped a mini boss. So Caden is now pretty much accepting of his new life, whatever that means, and thus accepts us as being a new person as well. We're no longer Revan, despite the revelation. Now again, we're not sure why we're here or what's going on. Turns out we landed on the colony of Dreshde on Corbin, and this guy knows that we're Revan. Oh, that's interesting. Everyone knows it now. Like this guy is named Ziagrum, I think. Apparently he placed a tracking device on our ship at our previous location, which could be anything because you can complete the story in any way. In this case, it was Manon, and he knew we were captured by the Leviathan and then started contacting his sources in the Empire. So us attacking and obliterating the people of the Leviathan caused a stir, and Malak ended up executing those to suppress the truth. That we're Revan, and we're chasing after Malak since we should be in charge. Okay. Now that's a pretty roundabout and contrived way of trying to get these Sith players to get a new plot line going. Not that we really need one, but it's the game's way of saying, hey, you know, you can still be Sith regardless of whatever revelation being Revan meant, if you want to. It's not necessary in this narrative, though, as the Revan revelation didn't change the character in any way. It was purely dramatic, if at all. And proving that you were a great Sith Lord in the past would only reinforce the storyline that, yes you are already going along with being a Sith. It's just a confirmation. And if you're playing as Jedi, it really makes no difference. So, Zegrim is a traitor and has expensive weapons and armor for us, and we just have to go to meet his partner Mika in the cantina, and this is all good business to him. A very strange way of making money, but okay, these guys were smart enough to put a tracker on our ship and pay off some top brass of the Empire to find out about the Leviathan, and, and Revan, and chased us down before we got here, just on the hopes that he might interest us in weapons and armor to sell us, on the assumption that Revan was going after Malak. He must be asking for a premium on this stuff, because that's a lot of effort and guesswork just to make a sale. So you could say this is where the game is trying way too hard and being a bit too self-aware. Usually that's a good thing, though. It was one thing to know the Ebon Hawk and get intel on the Leviathan. It's another to assume who Revan is, what he wants, that he's actually back, and to put trackers on ships and chase them around the galaxy before they arrive at locations before they do, all because of potential business of selling a few pieces of armor and weapons. And this is also where the philosophy of pacing being the number one element in the story outstrips or destroys every other element, including logic and believability. It's gone off the rails now. Another fellow tells us that Corbin houses a Sith Academy and is very accepting of Jedi who have left the Order. This would be a logical and practical place for Revan back in the day to recruit people into his war machine, Jedi or otherwise, if that was one of his methods. And this guy is also familiar with the Ebon Hawk. I mean, like, does everyone here know that we're Revan? We get a third cutscene of recruits trying to get into the Sith Academy. And for some reason, the guy in charge asks us how we should kill these three initiates who are trying to get into the Academy, because they're not evil enough. They would simply follow the orders of their commander without thinking things through, the order being to spare the life of an enemy. All right, let's say you become a Sith and I am your commanding officer. I give you an order to spare the life of an enemy. Do you do it? Oh, of course, Shardan. Anything you command us. We would never oppose you. No, no, no. Oh, do you honestly believe that the Sith are in need of such sniveling cowards? Mercy is a weakness. If your leader shows weakness, it is your duty to kill him and show true authority, true power. That is why the Sith are strong. Luckily, the dialogue gives you the option to mention your Darth Revan, or just use a persuade option, or even a force persuade option. These are all good RPG choices, whether you're going light or dark side. We then encounter some upperclassmen of the Sith Academy. This is already feeling like some kind of anime hazing ritual scenario complete with corny I'm Darth Revan dialogue options. Interestingly enough, you can choose that option and then they start laughing at you, which was good. 
because they asked you to make them laugh and you say, well, I'm Garth Revan, ha ha, or else they'd try and kill you. So this is actually working out rather well as an inside to the player and as a way to diffuse the situation while ironically telling the truth about being Darth Revan. This sort of theme is played throughout the entire experience here on Korriban in dialogue. Then another fellow you meet thinks that you work for Davik still, since you're using the Ebon Hawk, which was his ship. Thankfully, this is a non-Revan reference, and it's good to see the narrative filling in these blanks, or at least having variations on, hey, it's you, kind of NPC guy, that this level seems to have a lot of. And we finally get outside and to the front of the Sith Academy, and it looks like they're doing a kung fu style way of waiting to enter the temple in this case the sith has instructed these fellows to stand as long as possible that they would then be worthy of entering the temple after a certain amount of time they've been doing it for days and some have died apparently so you find the fellow who put them up to this idiots sith is not a bantha all endurance and no brains a sith would fight for his life no matter the odds if these rot grubs are as stupid as they seem, then they deserve their fate. To the Sith, at least to this fellow's interpretation, is a philosophy of power, but not just of body and aggression, but of the mind. The people struggling in this scenario is a parallel to what they think of the Jedi as a philosophy, that is, the useless nature of obedience and solitude, which is what Revan rebelled against. Similarly to the previous example of completely subservient subordinates, this Mechel fellow also wants the initiates to use their minds in defense of and seeking of greater power and disregarding concepts of mercy and compassion. The search is that for true power or true authority, whatever that is, and one should never disregard one's own power or ego in the quest for greater power. You can then try and convince the initiates to stop what they're doing. However, two of them think that you're just tricking them and one just collapses. Now, all this is not really plot relevant, outside of a few dialogue options admitting to others that you're Darth Revan, which has no weight and is just primarily used as jokes, just to showcase the philosophy and lifestyle of those under Sith tutelage. Now we're off to the cantina to find the actual Sith member named Euthura? Euthura Bon, who can admit people into the academy, and we meet some senpais who want to kill us because they're upperclassmen and think they're hot stuff. So we turn them into hot stuff, take their Sith medallions, and we try to get into the academy. But Loghain, well, says we still have to talk to Euthurabon, so we go back to the cantina. And there's another senpai, yet another force user, this time drunk on perhaps alcohol and power. He's hot stuff, yada yada, we find Euthura. Her view of the Sith is to encourage free thinking, and not that the Sith are evil, but, for example, the Sarkath beast who dominates the jungle. This is merely a part of nature. Whereas the Jedi are trying to serve the Force, she believes the Force serves them and their desires. Again, you can make another I am Revan dialogue joke. What about Revan? Revan is dead. You may have a natural gift for the Force, human, but you've no gift for lies. Right on both counts. We're quite powerful and we aren't lying which is all playing into the persona of being a Jedi. You don't lie, yet you have knowledge of yourself that no one else possesses, but you don't all release it into the wild, as well as playing the dark side persona as well. You're proud of what you are, even if you don't recall it. This is very similar, or a very similar feeling, to playing Planescape Torment. You know of some things of what the Nameless One did, but ultimately the player is going to do or play however they want, despite this deep, dark secret very few are aware of, Yet wherever you go, it seems your past life seems to have affected everyone in some way, large or small. You're still the quiet cipher for the player character, it's still trying to unravel what the secret of immortality was, or in this case, the Starforge, really is. Ah, so you are just another hopeful after all. Or are you? There is something odd about you that I cannot place. Ah, good. Exactly the sort of answer I was hoping for. Huh, apparently we are a good liar. So, we finally meet Darth NPC, and no one seems to recognize us, which is good. Must be our amazing head equipment. We, however, do not treat the Force as a burden. We treat it as a gift, a thing to be celebrated. We use it to acquire power over others. And why should we not? Because the Jedi say we should not. We are as the Force is meant to be. The Jedi would hide that from you. They would tell you the dark side is too quick, too easy. 
all so that they need never challenge the passions that lie within them. Now, this explanation or understanding of the dark side is not relevant to this plot, but it gives some background on what Revan was struggling with, why the Jedi disliked him, yet what he had to do in order to fight the Mandalorians. And you, young human, does this interest you? Are you ready to learn more of what I speak? Are you? I can see into your heart, young human, and I see the dark kernel that is there. If it is ready to sprout, remains to be seen. Again, it's a small insight into the player character, but it's enough for us to understand what the Force or what Revan was. This could have been a great moment for a Sith teacher or master to peer into the being that is Revan or whatever is left of Revan, regardless of his ego or your memory. It's that thing that's related specifically to the Force that could have gone into detail, but it appears it's merely the capacity to use the Force and it's stripped of ego. So the Force is kind of like a, an appendage. It just needs to be flexed in order to become stronger. The one who succeeds will be admitted to the Academy as a full Sith. All others must wait until next year and try again, if you survive. I think it's a pretty good chance most of these guys, if not all of them, are going to die. So, the good thing about this dialogue is the master or instructor doesn't make the dark side to be some crazy bloodthirsty philosophy, even though if that's the reality. It's just embracing what you are and not shying away from it to the point of being so bold that using the force makes it easier for an individual to kill another because they're just so impassioned with it or their own selves. The problem is still the clarity or why we're here the supposedly reason for the star map, but we never got a dream vision. Now, this could be because Shepard wasn't near us when we were sleeping. Uh, after all, she was taken by Malak, and thus we need her proximity, maybe, in order to induce the visions. But there's been no mention of star maps or asking about secret ancient relics or anything causing problems with the wildlife. We're just assuming that's what's going on. While this isn't a, a huge problem in the story, it does raise the question of why this wasn't clarified, what's going on, and why even in dialogue such an important plot point is not even brought up. Remember, we have two goals. Stop Malak, find the Star Forge. Since we can't stop Malak, or fail to do so because of an immovable door, we must deduce Korriban has a star map because there's no other reason to be here. 